So without further ado, let me introduce the first speaker, Ron DeVore from uh, Texas A&M and the University of South Carolina. Here in North Carolina, we're always pleased that there's a South Carolina. Okay. <laughs> so let's see. How do I get to my, uh, Larry will come and help me. He'll be here. We need an engineer to help. Okay, so uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak at Ingrid's birthday. I wanted to begin with some uh, personal reflections. Uh, I first met Ingrid in 1992. Uh, she was delivering the Shanks lectures at Vanderbilt. And uh, of course, I knew a lot about her work uh, having read her papers and knew she was a great mathematician, but I was very impressed as to her personality being a very compassionate and generous uh, person. And uh, over the years, I got to know her better, and I coerced her into an invitation uh, to do a sabbatical at Princeton in 1997. And while there, I began to see her many dimensions. Maybe that's why we have this conference on high dimensions. Ingrid is very high dimensional. Cooking, gardening, raising a family, time she spent with her students. I see a lot of students of Ingrid's uh, that have come back here, and you should realize that not every advisor spends this inordinate amount of time with their students and supports them in the years that follow. Well, we worked together some, and our environment was two things. One, we, had, we, we used to have these philosophical discussions. And at that time, one of the, the topics was, are signals and images, are they uh, stochastic or deterministic? And of course, I was on the deterministic side, and Ingrid seemed to be on my side. We talked a lot with engineers who were very much on the stochastic side. And one time we were talking and it seemed like Ingrid was drifting and for, for a while and sort of supporting the other side. And then she looked over at me and said, don't worry, I'm not going over to the other side. <laughs> and uh, we used to do work at the blackboard. I think it was a blackboard then. It wasn't whiteboards around. I don't remember exactly. But, uh, you know, when you're doing uh, work, uh, you always come to a point where something complicated uh, happens and you look and you say, my God, am I going to have to try to figure this out? I mean, this, is, this, this will take me forever and it will be very painful. And that's when Ingrid would jump up to the blackboard, push me aside and do some calculation that freed us from this misery and moved us on to the next step. Uh, so... It sort of reminds me of uh, the story about the guy that uh, finds a, a, a bottle and releases a genie. And uh, the genie says, well, you have one wish. And uh, he said, well, you know, I like to travel. I like to go to Hawaii, but, but I hate flying. Can you build a bridge for me from Los Angeles to Hawaii? And the genie thought a little bit and said, are you crazy? I mean, it's so far from Los Angeles, this is impossible. You have to come up with another wish. And he said, well, you know, I've been trying to study this math and trying to figure out how this Ingrid Dobachi thinks. You know, how does she come up with these ideas that are orthogonal to everybody else? Could you explain to me what, you know, what goes on in her brain? And uh, the genie thought a little bit, and he said, do you want two lanes or four lanes on that bridge? <laughs> well, I told you that Ingrid has a lot of dimensions. I'm going to show you some of these dimensions and uh, you may not be aware of. So here's uh, a spiritual side of Ingrid. 
paying homage to her work. And I don't know if she was chanting something or what was go going on, but... Uh, and then, of course, this terrible moment, Ingrid, where you got arrested. <laughs> Look at the fright in your eyes holding up your hands. But don't worry, it all worked out pretty well. She got released, and we began celebrating after her release. So here's Ingrid celebrating, and then celebrating some more. A lot of men around her, Rob. Pay attention, Rob. A lot of men around Ingrid here. Still celebrating. Okay, so, you know, one thing you may not know about Ingrid is she, she always was worried that uh, maybe if she didn't make it in mathematics, what is she going to do? So she actually had uh, trained herself for a second career, and that was in uh, the entertainment field. And here's Ingrid uh, putting on a performance, uh, singing, dancing, all kinds of things with some other people. And then finally, of course, uh, stealing the show with her, uh, her dance at the end. So even uh, mathematics was done in this uh, cycle. Here's her with Albert Cohen, and they're actually belting out something about biorthogonal uh, wavelets. And then finally, Ingrid says, we got it. Okay, so now I turn to the less serious part of the talk. Uh, of it, uh, you can say that on a personal level, definitely Ingrid is, is not greedy, so this subject is perhaps not uh, the best uh, topic to fit that, although she has used greedy procedures in her mathematics. So what I want to do is talk about a certain greedy algorithm that's uh, used heavily in, in uh, numerical PDEs, and try, I think it may, may be uh, useful in signal and image processing as well. And I will try to understand uh, why people are interested in this uh, algorithm. So this algorithm takes place in a Banach space, when, and you have a compact manifold K in this Banach space. And what you'd like to do is uh, to find uh, a way to find a good uh, linear manifold that approximates this uh, manifold. And you're going to do it by querying the manifold and querying it in a cert sort of a greedy fashion that I will explain in just a moment. Now, we know that uh, typically these greedy algorithms don't perform well, and so the question to me was, uh, why do they do this? And can we prove something about these algorithms? Now, uh, unfortunately, I don't have much time to tell you about the PDE aspect of this, but I briefly tell you something about it so that you can understand where this came from. It, it applies to parametric problems where you have a lot of uh, PDEs that you want to, to, to solve. And an example would be uh, these uh, diffusion equations where uh, you have an elliptic problem and you have a, a family of diffusion coefficients A. So the script A is a class, a, a large class of diffusion coefficients. And as A, little a, runs through this script A, you get a manifold. We, we know that the solution depends smoothly on uh, distortion in the uh, uh, coefficient A. So changing A doesn't change the solution much. So we get a smooth manifold as A runs through the set script A. The solutions U carve out a manifold, which I denote by U sub A. And the, the goal is to find a good numerical procedure to give an query little a to find a solution U A fast and online. A typical model, for example, uh, of this is the affine model where you have A is a sum of uh, some function psi j, maybe a wavelet basis or some uh, coherent and nerve basis or whatever, and the parameters are yj, these coefficients, and you can always normalize this so that the yj's take values between minus 1 and 1 or in the complex unit ball. And you do this by 
renormalizing the psi j's. So uh, typically, the, the smoothness of the manifold will depend on how fast these uh, norms of the psi j's in L infinity tend to zero. So this is the manifold the people in PDEs want to capture and are willing to spend a lot of time off offline, as they say, finding a, a, a good uh, Galerkin's space to approximate this manifold. And what does a Galerkin space mean? It means they're going to query the manifold and they're going to find parameter values A1, A2 through AN and then look at the solutions U sub A1, U sub A2, U sub AN and use this as a Galerkin space. So for you, you can just think that I have this manifold and I want to query it, take it some uh, points on the manifold, and from those points create a good linear space approximation to the manifold. And think of the manifold as very high dimensional. So how should you find these queries? How should you take the queries? And that's where this greedy algorithm comes in. Now you can, uh, you know, forget the PDEs and move to just an approximation problem. And here's the approximation problem. You have a, a Bonnock space X. This is how you're going to measure performance or distortion or error. In a PDE context, the distortion is measured in the energy norm. And we, we have a compact set of functions K. We think of it as a manifold, but it can be any compact set. And we want to query K in order to create a good uh, linear uh, manifold to approximate the uh, manifold K. So uh, what we're going to look for is some functions or some points F0 through Fn minus 1 in K and then we're going to form the linear space spanned by them and we'd like these, uh, this space to be able to approximate any F in K. So we're looking to find uh, some snapshots, these are called snapshots, of the manifold such that when we create this linear space Vn, it will approximate every f in the manifold, every f in k to an accuracy epsilon, some given target ac accuracy. And we'd like to, of course, do this with capital N as small as possible. So that, that's, that's our, our game. And here's the algorithm the people in the reduced basis or reduced modeling came up with. And uh, embarrassingly, I hadn't seen this algorithm until it was explained to me by Yvon Madé. And here's what they do. The first uh, selection they make is they look at the manifold K and they take the function which has biggest norm, biggest X norm. Remember, X is the Bonnach space in which we measure distortion. So they take the uh, function with biggest norm in X as the, the first query. We'll get into a, a little bit how, how they actually do that. I mean, it's not obvious how you would search the whole manifold and find such a function. So think theoretically for now. So after you've taken your snapshots F0 to Fn minus 1, suppose you've taken some of these snapshots, how do you get the next one? Well, you look at the current space you have, Vn. That's the current space you have, which is the span of F0 through Fn minus 1. And you look at how it performs. And you look at uh, all the functions in K and see how well Vn does in approximating these functions. And as your next choice, you choose the function for which the performance is worse, right? The one that you're having the hardest time capturing. It's like, you know, having a, a, in a soccer game, you know, you're playing a soccer game and one guy is killing you from the other side, your best strategy, get that guy over onto your side. So that's what this Fn is. You're taking the, the guy that's killing you in the approximation and putting him on your side. So this is the uh, greedy algorithm. You're, you're doing this one step at a time. And we, generally speaking, know that such greedy algorithms do not perform well. Uh, and so it's kind of interesting to see, well, does this particular strategy work? So uh, before doing that, I, uh, discussing that, I want to mention that there is a weak form of this greedy algorithm. In numerical implementation, uh, it's, uh, uh, one doesn't really query the, the, the manifold uh, uh, directly, but one uses, for example, in the PDE con context, you use a residual 
to uh, give an estimate for the error and then base all your algorithm on this residual estimate so it won't be completely accurate. And so that leads you to, to studying things like a weak greedy algorithms where at each stage you don't require that as the function that's furthest distance but just within a constant of the biggest distance. For example, the first choice, F0, would be a point which is bigger than a gamma times the maximum uh, norm of the Fs uh, from K. So gamma here you can choose as any fixed parameter between zero and one. If you choose gamma equal one, you get the greedy algorithm. And at each stage you use this gamma. Instead of finding the function that's furthest distance, you just need to do it within uh, this uh, uh, constant gamma. So this is a weak greedy algorithm, and this is typically what's uh, used. And my question is, how does this algorithm perform? Well, given this, uh, you know, to, to, to discuss the performance, I, I always advocate trying to compare it with the best possible performance. And in this case, the best possible performance would be the following. It's the Kolmogorov width of this set K. Namely, uh, you look at the set K and you look at all possible n-dimensional spaces V that could be used to approximate K. And you look at the infimum over all such V and, that, uh, and then the performance of that uh, space gives you this Kolmogorov width. So this dn of k, written there on the, on the uh, screen, is the best performance you can, you can have. So when you look at your greedy algorithm, if you kept, came close to finding dn of k, if you could prove that the, the, the vn you create with the greedy algorithm performs like dn of k, well, you'd feel great. You would, uh, you know, smoke a cigar, have uh, some champagne or something, and retire. Uh, of course, we don't expect that to be the case, but this is a good benchmark for, for the performance. Now, in actuality, we have our procedure, the greedy algorithm, and what it does. Now, it generates a space Vn, which I explained to you, and it has a certain error, which I'll denote by sigma n. So sigma n is the performance of the algorithm, and dn is the best possible performance that God would be able to get for you using Kolmogorov widths. And we're interested, how do these two compare? Well, the first result I heard about this by uh, people in this uh, reduced basis, uh, you can see their, their names there, five uh, people, was they proved that sigma n was less than a constant, little n, two to the n, dn of k. Well, you know, there's a pretty big constant there, n <laughs> times two to the n. Let's say we're trying to do this and little n is uh, 20. Wow, I mean, a constant is so huge there, it's, it, it just doesn't look like it's uh, that useful of an estimate. Although I must say that in the PDE context, sometimes you can prove this manifold is analytic and therefore you actually get uh, exponential decay of the n width and this doesn't turn out to be too bad of an estimate. But anyway, we wanted to see, well, is this the best you can say? So if you want to beat uh, five people, you get six people. And here are the six people that began uh, working on this. And we began looking at this in the context that the reduced basis people look at it, namely for approximation in a Hilbert space. In their case, they have the energy space for the uh, elliptic equations. And, uh, we began to see, well, can we do better than this rate n two to the n uh, dn, which wouldn't give you anything if, if for, for example, the n width decayed like a polynomial. And lo and behold, uh, we could prove uh, this first theorem, this polynomial decay theorem, which says that if dn of k decays like n to the minus alpha, then the greedy algorithm gives the same decay. Isn't that wonderful? Even it looked real bad because of this two to the n in front, but you can actually prove if you have polynomial decay, the greedy algorithm performs with the same polynomial decay rate. Okay, so that was uh, very nice, and this applies to either the, 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 the strong greedy algorithm or the weak greedy algorithm. And as an example for PDEs, if I return to that affine model, and if I, uh, look at these uh, norms of these side j's, which I told you, 
how fast A decay to zero sort of governs the smoothness of the manifold, then we have uh, proved the theorem, which is a quite substantial theorem, uh, that the uh, n width decays like n to the one minus one over p. So now p here is less than one, so you get a rate n to the minus alpha where alpha is bigger than zero, and that means that this greedy algorithm would give the same performance, and that's basically the best uh, analytic result known for this problem. Okay, there's some results on sub-exponential rates, but uh, I skipped that in the interest of time. By the way, Rob, uh, I started about five minutes late. Yeah, okay, so we're on, in the same ballpark. Uh, so uh, something bothered me about uh, the results we got. Even though we had this nice polynomial decay rate theorem, we never really had a, a direct estimate between sigma n and, and dn like uh, the, this result of the five authors that I mentioned, Buffa, Made, they had a direct estimate, but they had a very lousy constant in front, right? n times two to the n. And we didn't resolve that problem by getting a better constant in front. We had some other techniques and, and proved this polynomial decay rate. But I wanted to get back wh whether you can give direct estimates. And so how do you do that? Well, you have six authors and you get rid of three of them so that you can uh, Progress. That's a joke. Uh, the three that weren't, weren't there were, are very strong people. So uh, I, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, those results. So uh, among other things, so again, let me stick for the Hil to the Hilbert space case for a moment. And uh, we came up with a direct uh, estimate. And uh, here's uh, one version of the direct estimate. We actually have several uh, comparisons. And look at the second bullet from the bottom, which says, I can give you a di direct comparison of sigma 2n with sigma n. But there's a square root there. But at least now I have a direct comparison. If I know something about dn tending to 0, I immediately get something about sigma n. I don't have to assume that uh, dn behaves like n to the minus alpha or anything. I can apply this in any case. Uh, OK. Uh, finally, I want to mention that uh, in some contexts, uh, we don't want to work in a Hilbert space. This is even true in the PDE setting. So that all this theory goes through to some extent uh, for a general Banach space. <coughs> so in the same paper, we looked at the uh, problem of uh, a manifold K in a, or F in a uh, Banach space X. And the results we got parallel those for the uh, Hilbert space case that I mentioned here on a previous slide. The only difference is that you have a factor here, square root of n, appearing everywhere. So look at this first result, which compares sigma 2n with square root of dn. Now all of a sudden I have this square root of n in front. So that's uh, the, the, the price you pay for doing it in a general Banach space. I think if you want to do it in LP, you would probably be able to put in there n to the absolute value of 1 half minus 1 over p, although that's not been proven yet. Uh, in particular, you would get that if you had uh, the n width decaying like n to the minus alpha, then the greedy algorithm in this Banach space setting now, you wouldn't get rate n to the minus alpha, you would get n to the minus alpha plus a half, basically. You get plus beta for any beta bigger than a half and you can give a result with a logarithm. Now for anybody that's uh, very sharp, you wonder is, he, is this loss of the square root of n, is that a necessary loss? And the answer is yes, we can prove that it's necessary. And if you want to relate it to your previous knowledge, think of Cotet's snow bar theorem. I don't know how many of you know the Cotet's snow bar theorem, but it says take a Banach space, take an n-dimensional subspace, how small can I make the projection onto this n-dimensional subspace? And they proved that for any n-dimensional subspace of a Banach space, they're the projection with norm square root of n. And you can't do better than square root of n. Now for a Hilbert space, you can get projection with norm uh, one, right? So uh, the square root of n factor occurs because we're dealing with a general uh, Banach space. Okay, I close with that, and I think I stayed within the time limit.
think we have time for one question, if there's a question in the audience. Uh -huh, moral. Coefficient. Then in that case, if uh, you just knew that the uh, some smoothness of the manifold, uh, some smoothness for the solutions, you get rate n to the minus alpha divided by d, where alpha is the smoothness. So now the question is, can, can we get around this curse of dimensionality, which you do by assuming you have some sparsity or a low dimensional manifold? In this case, the dimension of the manifold is po possibly large, but the dependence on the parameters is changing. It depends strongly on the first few big parameters, or first few terms, and then weaker as you move along. I don't know if I answered that, uh, your question, but I, I hope so. <laughs>